Secondly, approval of the proceedings from November 2015. Any changes or additions to the minutes to, of November 2015? Seeing none, uh, approved by consent. Um, is there any public comment uh, on items not on the agenda? Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Raymond Kane, Commercial Fisherman, Chatham, Massachusetts. I'd like to commend the Commission on the hard work they put into this amendment. I guess we'll see the outcome by the end of the day. But there is still an elephant in the room, and that elephant is we have no spawning protection still to this day on George's Bank and Nantucket Shoals. I've been here for years. I saw the white paper, and I've also heard the lack of funding. But this it will be directed towards the uh, New England directors. They're each sitting at this table. And this will eventually affect New Jersey and New York with landings. I, I, as God is my judge, I don't know how they can come out with these assessments. And we're supposed to believe in the science. And yet, we don't know what's going on with the spawning biomasses on George's Bank and Nantucket Shoals. So I know. I'll probably hear back from this commission that we don't have a place in that. You're talking federal waters. But we have all directors here from the New England Council, and I wish they'd make a concerted effort in the future in addressing this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Any other public comment on items not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, <clears throat> we'll move on to draft amendment three to the Atlantic Herring Fisheries Management Plan, final action, review, review of the options. Ashton. Okay, I'll wait for them to come up. Okay, so I'm going to go through the public comment summary for draft amendment three for the Atlantic Herring Fishery Management Plan. Next slide. Before I begin, I wanted just to go over a brief timeline of um, the recent actions that were taken for this document this past year. So in August 2015, the board tasked the PT with revising the spawning area efficacy options with the goal to protect uh, spawning fish by prohibiting the landing of Atlantic herring caught within the specific spawning areas. The PDT took this information and, and revised the spawning area efficacy options. Um, they were planned to be we were going to uh, produce a whole entire draft amendment at the November meeting. However, upon further review of the document, we noticed that were there, there were some other changes. Therefore, we brought forward a public hearing document at the annual meeting. The section uh, subsequently approved the public hearing document, which was a, sub, a segment of the, the larger document. So it basically just had the management area options in there and a description of the resource. This public hearing document was taken to public comment in December of 2015 through January of 2016. Um, as you can see, we had four public hearings in Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, and we received nine written comments from organizations. So during this time, while we were going out to public hearing, the PDT was also pulling together the complete draft amendment three, which you saw was released um, first via the briefing materials, then it was subsequently revised, and it was released again in the supplemental materials. Um, so, as you can see in the supplemental materials, there was a couple of changes that were highlighted in yellow. I'll just note them now. The stock assessment section was revised and more figures were added. Um, a paragraph was added in uh, 2.7 resource community aspects, simply to note that the fishery is restricted to purse seine and fixed gear during the summer months, and there are no gear restrictions after, the, after October 1st. Lastly, uh, the fixed gear section was changed to specific, specifically note that the fixed gear set aside is up to 500 metric tons. However, the current specifications set it at 295 metric tons. Okay. So here in front of you today is the full document. Note that all sections were reviewed and or edited by the PDT. Um, I also submitted in briefing materials a decision document, which is basically a summary of this uh, presentation that I'm going to give today. Next slide. So the management options that we are considering are issue one, spawning area efficacy. Underneath that, it encompasses spawning area monitoring system, default closure dates and trigger values, 
spawning area boundaries, spawning closure period, and then a reclosure period. The second issue is fixed gear set aside. The third issue is empty fish hold provision. I will note that the empty fish hold provision was brought about um, in conjunction with uh, New England Fisheries Management Council's Framework 4. However, they are still preparing the final rule so that, so we do not know if NIMS will approve or not approve the empty fish hold provision. Okay. So now I'm going to just jump right into the public comment period. So at first, just the, the structure, I'm going to go through each management option and just kind of give a brief explanation of it. And then I will go through the public comments that you can see are in red. So for the spawning area closure monitoring system, this is the technical aspect of when to issue a spawning area closure. It's based on the female gonadosomatic index, commonly known as GSI. So for option A, status quo, as we all know, two commercial catch samples that were taken within seven days of each other, a sample size is defined as 100 adult fish um, within two separate size class triggers, will initiate a spawning area closure. Option B is essentially the same thing as status quo, except there's two main differences. Samples can come from fisheries independent or dependent sources. Um, right now, it's only commercial catch samples. Also, there was a sentence that was added that says, the fishery will remain open if sufficient samples are available, but they do not contain ripe female herring. The PDT did want to draw caution to this one specific sentence because not all states have independent sampling programs for Atlantic herring. Therefore, if sufficient samples were collected but didn't show spawning herring, maybe because of gear biases, then that area would not close. So option C is uh, the GSI 30 based forecast system. So a little bit of background on this one. This is the new one. Uh, the PDT, more really the technical committee, um, developed this option um, based on review of 8,000 GSI observations uh, over a 12-year period of time. And so they determined that uh, they determined that this forecasting system would be better because it would more accurately um, predict when spawning fish were in the area and therefore when to close spawning areas. So there was a, there was a common concern that spawning areas were being closed too early and therefore they weren't um, encompassing the full time period of when herring were spawning. So for this example, you would have three samples comprised of at least 25 female herring and gonadal stages three through five would comprise a sample. And from there, a, a date would be forecasted within five days. So would, this would give more time for the industry to, to know when a spawning area would close. Okay, so now for the public comments. So for option A, status quo, there were two written comments. Um, one person felt that a pilot program should parallel the existing system for at least a year before we were locked into a new system via this amendment. Um, so another comment said they wanted it to be ground truth before it becomes the standard method. Um, another person said that they liked the status quo and they thought it worked reasonably well. They just noted that there were some issues with the default dates. And there was a discussion about that. And um, for GSI, the option C, it was said that we would hopefully be relying less on default dates. Nevertheless, for option B, there was one person in favor of this. And it wasn't so much that they were in favor of the entire option B. It's just that they felt that samples should come from fisheries independent or dependent sources. We shouldn't be limited to one. For option C, you can see that we have the, the majority of, um, of those are in favor of option C during the public hearing process, and people just felt that if science shows that it will more accurately close the spawning area closures, then that's the one that we should use. Um, people also liked it because it relied on a forecasting method, and they would have more um, advanced, advanced warning of when areas will close. There was one concern that says they were concerned about the, the sample size. So right now it's three samples of 25 uh, female herring and gonadal stages, three through five. People thought maybe that was low considering the current sample size is 100. However, there is a difference because right now it's 100 adult size fish, whereas in the revised method it would be 25 female herring and gonadal stages, three through five. So it, it's a little bit more specific. There's also no upper bound on how many um, in a sample we would have to have. It just says a minimum of 25, there's no maximum. So now moving into the default closure dates. So these are directly linked to the spawning area closure monitoring system. These are the only spawning area options that are linked together. So for option A, status quo, um, there's the same default dates that we've always had, the same for option B as well. 
Option C is where there's different trigger values, as you can see, um, based on if you want the forecasting method. So there's sub-option C1, which is uh, a 70th percentile. It closes the, the, uh, the fishery earlier to protect, uh, to protect mature, maturing fish. There's sub-option C2. This is a later closing. It would protect um, fish at the later stages of maturity. There's sub-option C3, the 90th percentile, which would close the, the fishery just prior to spawning. So we have one in favor of status quo. Uh, there was no one in favor of one in favor of status quo. For option C2, C1, there was two people in favor of this one. Um, they viewed it as the most conservative and therefore most likely to protect pre-spawning a mature fish. Two were in favor of C2 because it was determined to be in the middle. Also, people felt that default dates that are shown here more closely aligned to the actual spawning times. It, and they felt that it would protect the majority of spawning fish. They also specifically noted that um, they felt that C3 was far too late for a default date. Uh, those in favor of sub-option C3, you can see there's 17. The majority of the, the main public hearing is, is what kind of bumped up those numbers. Um, they felt that it would minimize the ongoing concerns of the spawning area closing prematurely. They also felt that uh, this would kind of allow a little bit of a uh, spawning tolerance as well. So for the spawning area boundaries, we have option A, status quo, maintain the current spawning area boundaries. There's three spawning area boundaries. Um, there's also option B, combine the Western Maine and Mass New Hampshire spawning areas. GSI analysis suggests that Western Maine and Mass New Hampshire do not have significantly different spawning times. Therefore, it was suggested that they should be combined. So the majority of the public comments were in favor of uh, status quo option A. So just remaining the three, the three areas that we have now, people felt comfortable with them. People also didn't want to run the risk of merging two areas together and then uh, having a large section of the coast being closed at one time. Two people were in favor of option B because they felt it had the potential to increase sample sizes and therefore we could more accurately close the spawning area if we have more sample sizes for one area. For the spawning closure period, there's option A, four weeks, status quo. There's option B, six weeks, and this was suggested um, based on a literature review that herring typically spawn for approximately 40 days. The public comment um, stated that the majority of, felt comfortable with the four-week time period that's, that's currently proposed. Um, it was seen as protecting the majority of spawning fish. Option B. Um, had support from three written comments. Um, they just felt that it was based on a literature review that was provided in the technical committee report and that it, if it's a spawning area closure and that, if that's how long they spawn for, then that's how long the area should be closed for. The spawning reclosure period. So we have option A, status quo. So sampling um, happens for two weeks after an area is reopened. If, one, if a sample contains 25% or more mature herring, then it would initiate a reclosure. Then there's option B, which is a more defined protocol. So this one says, in addition to other language, a one sample in the last week or after, one sample can be taken in the last week of the initial closure or in the first week after the area is reopened. It defines the sample as 100 adult size fish and then goes on to say that if 25% or more um, in a sample would initiate a reclosure. So it just kind of gives a little bit of more specifics around the status quo that we already have, defining what the sample is, and also allowing uh, samples to be taken in the last week of the initial closure. There's also option C, no reclosure protocol. Um, this one was developed only to be linked with the six-week six initial closure period. Um, it, was, it was felt that if six weeks encompasses the entire spawning period of herring, therefore there would need, need to be no reclosure protocol. So for the written, uh, for the public comment, two were in favor of status quo. Um, as you can see, option B, defined protocol, the majority including, um, which is mostly made up of, um, of Maine, are for the defined protocol. People are interested in sampling in the last week of the initial closure. One comment wanted the text to actually be reworded so that sampling has to occur in the last week of the initial closure. However, I just want to note that uh, we, like I said before, no state has an independent sampling program. We do rely a lot on commercial catch samples, therefore it might be a little tricky to have the, the wording so narrowly defined as only in the last week. Uh, one was in favor of no reclosure. Uh, this person felt that a four-week period was viewed as enough, as enough time. 
So th that concludes the, the spawning area efficacy options and the, the public comment that we received on those options. For issue two, the fixed gear set aside rollover, we have option A, status quo. So right now, um, the area one sub ACL, 295 metric tons is set aside for the fixed gear fishery. And they have, to, they have that to use from until November. If they have not used it, then it's rolled over into the, the rest of the fishery. So mobile gear can then use the 295 metric tons, any part of it that has not been previously used. Um, there's also option B, which is to remove the rollover provision. So the 295 metric tons will, roll, will never roll over into Area 1A mobile gear fishery. It'll always be allotted to the fixed gear fishery for the entire year. So we had one that was in favor of option A status quo. Um, they said that any changes will make the state and federal FMPs inconsistent. Uh, we also had one person say that they wanted the fixed gear set aside removed entirely. Um, and then we also had four people that were in favor of option B. Uh, they felt that limited access has been, the fixed gear fishery has had limited access to the resource and therefore they, were, they felt that they were entitled to any amount of, uh, of set aside that they could have. So this is issue three, the empty fish hold provision. And like I said before, uh, this was originally brought about because it's also in the council's framework four. And I'm gonna walk through this one um, through a couple of slides because there's five different options and they can be quite confusing if shown all at once. So for the empty fish hold provision, option A, status quo. No empty fish hold provision, vessels can uh, leave, leave the dock without anyone inspecting the vessel. So then we have two different wordings that we took to public comment. So the empty fish hold provision, the first one on the top mirrors what's in framework four. Simply says that uh, this option would require the fish holds on category A and B vessels to be empty of fish before leaving the dock on any trip when declared into the Atlantic Herring Fishery. Uh, through, the commission had um, subsequent meetings with the advisory panel last year and they, um, they made a little bit of a different wording to, to what is in framework four. So the, uh, the other language says only, this language would only apply to vessels with the ability to pump fish. So specifically it says, this option will require the fish holds on category A and B vessels with the ability to pump fish are empty of fish before leaving the dock on any trip when declared into the Atlantic Herring Fishery. So this was a little bit of background. This was brought about because there were some fishermen um, in Rhode Island who have freezer vessels. So when they come into the dock and if, they, so they basically they process at sea. If there's any reason for them to come into the dock, be it mechanical failure, some kind of weather circumstance, they don't want to empty their fish hold unless it's full because it require, it's a fee to, they have to pay in order to empty. So they would rather just take the care of the problem at the dock and then go right back out and continue to fish and process fish until the fish hold is completely full. That's how it originally came um, to have the second option in wording. So next we have contingent on federal adoption, just meaning if NIMS approves this, then we would move forward with it. Um, we also have language that says, regardless of what frame happens in framework for final rule, the states would move forward with this, with this option regardless, meaning that states would have to supply the resources to check category A and B vessels um, each time they go into the fishery. So now we're ready to show all five of the options all at once. Okay, so you, now you can see option A, status quo, no empty fish hold provision. Option B1 is, is basically, it's, it's what's in um, framework four, and it just says that if framework four passes, then we'll move forward with option B1. Um, B2 is the state empty fish hold provision, so it's not contingent on federal adoption, so we would move forward with this using the language that's in framework four, regardless. C1 is the federal state empty fish hold provision for select vessels. So the, the, the C options mean are the wording that was changed by the commission to only apply to vessels that pump. So for C1 would, is contingent on federal adoption, but it would only apply to vessels that pump. C2 uh, is not contingent on federal adoption. The states would move forward with this regardless, but it only applies to vessels that pump. Okay, so now I'll go through the public comment for, for this one. Okay, so there was two in favor of status quo. Uh, the act of, they felt the act of checking vessels prior to, de to departure was seen as too restrictive because it affects how and when fishermen sell their fish. Um, there was also concern that inspection of each vessel prior to departure might delay trips. There was one in favor of option B1. Uh, they felt that 
This, this, they, liked, they were in favor of the empty official provision as written in Framework 4 and only if Framework 4 was adopted. There were about, there was multiple people from Maine, um, so, which is about eight people in addition to two written comments that are in favor of B2. Uh, so some, so this would use the same language that's in Framework 4, but we would move forward with it regardless of what NIPS did. So the states would move forward with this. There was three people in, uh, in favor of C1. So this is the, the language that says that it's only for select vessels that can pump, but it's contingent on federal adoption. There was also three people in favor of uh, the state empty official provision for select vessels, not contingent on federal adoption, so the states would move forward with it regardless. There was also, I just want to mention for the, for these, the language that says that it would only apply to vessels that pump. So it was originally brought about because of the freezer vessels that process at sea. However, during the public comment period, we also heard that there's some vessels that, that do not have pumps and they, they, they don't have pumps. And when they come into sea, they have maybe 10,000, 10,000 tons. And a truckload is 40,000. They felt that they didn't, they would, they would lose out on business opportunities if they only had 10,000, yet they couldn't go out to sea, but they couldn't put their fish into a truck because it's not enough fit. The truck's not going to come down just for 10,000 10, tons, so they felt that this measure would be really restricted for them. Therefore, they wanted, they specifically felt that uh, having the language that says only vessels that pump would comply is, would work for them because they don't pump fish. I know that might be a little confusing, so any questions on that, feel free to ask. Um, so there was also other comments um, for the fixed gear fishery. They just said that the fixed gear fishery should be open in April or May time period. Basically, they wanted to be open earlier than June. They felt that June was far too late. They didn't see any fish in the fixed gear fishery, um, and that they're fair, they felt it was unequal. There's also a comment that the 20% spawning tolerance should be reinstated. Uh, if not for the entire fishing year, then at least until October 1st. Okay, so I will take questions now in the public comment. Thank you, Ashton. Uh, thorough and well presented. Any questions, uh, David? Yeah, thanks. You, thank you, Ashton. That was a, a good summary. Uh, I might have missed it. Um, were there any comments during the public hearings relative to the nature of fishery independent samples that would be used to judge whether the fish was still spawning? I don't think we have in the document anything that describes what that means. So uh, were there any comments to that effect? Can you say, uh, so you, you were asking about fishery independent samples. Is there any, and then that, and I trailed off right there. Yeah, the, uh, we say that the fisheries dependent or fisheries independent samples could be taken to judge where the spawning was still continuing. Fisheries dependent's kind of obvious, but fisheries independent, uh, were there any uh, questions asked by the by those at the hearings regarding what that would entail, what that would mean, what actually would be looked at? No, there there was not. More people felt that if any samples can be available, then they should be used. They just felt that we shouldn't discriminate and only use commercial catch samples. They, there was never any questions as to where the fishery independent samples would come from or what they would be used for. Okay, thank you. Um, and this one other thing. Regarding the public hearings, I uh, chaired the one in Gloucester um, to uh, give those present an indication of the nature of the comments that occurred in Gloucester. And it's an important location, of course, because of one of the major uh, processors uh, present in Gloucester. I would just refer uh, the, the section to a couple of uh, comment letters that do a real good job describing what was said in favor of different options and opposed to different options. And that would be uh, one letter being uh, the one from Pew, Pew Charitable Trusts, where they describe their different positions on all of the elements such as spawning area e efficacy. And then the other one would be from, um, let's see, from uh, uh, Sean Gian representing uh, Cape Seafoods and others in Gloucester. Uh, and he, uh, on behalf of those groups, provided uh, the perspective that was uh, highlighted uh, frequently by uh, Jerry O'Neill, who is uh, the manager of, of Cape Seafood. So again, for those wanting to know what happened in Gloucester, those two letters characterize the nature of the discussion very well. Doug? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ashton. Um, I wanted to ask a question about uh, some of the revisions that were made uh, to Amendment 3 um, that's outlined in our supplemental materials, and specifically um, the revision that was made in Section 2.7, Resource Community Aspects. There's a statement here that says the summer restrictions on Area 1A to fix gear and purse saints is said to have led to a significant increase in price of herring for bait, which has the, a potentially major impact on the lobster fishery. Notably, mid, midwater pear trawlers are not allowed in Area 1A until October 1. Um, where did this this uh, addition come from, and what was the uh, reason for it? And I have a some couple concerns about it, uh, so I'd like to hear why it was put in and where where this uh, wording came from. Okay, uh, so the intent of that section was simply to note that the, the summer fishery is restricted to fixed gear and purseine. Um, gear types, and then after October 1st, it's open to it's open to all gear types. The first sentence that says um, is said to have that came from a council document. Well, my concern here one uh, is our document saying something like is said to have led to, but more importantly, there are other things that have occurred during that same period that that. Uh, could have also uh, impacted the increase in, in uh, <laughs> prices of herring. Um, most specifically, we've had some substantial quota reductions. If you all remember back prior to 2006, the quota for the herring fishery was around 150,000 metric tons. And then around the time of the implementation of Amendment 1, we went down to about 140 to 143,000 metric tons. And then in, 10th, in 2010, when we had to implement our specifications uh, based on the revised Magnuson Act, we had a substantial, uh, further substantial reduction in, in quota uh, for herring to uh, around 90 to 93,000 metric tons. And my uh, economics class on supply and demand <laughs> is if you're reducing the supply, that can drive up, also drive up your, your pricing. On top of that, my other concern with that statement is the fact that throughout that period, with the exception of one year, the Area 1A quota has been fully utilized. And the only year it wasn't fully utilized um, was a year in which the other three areas went over their quota. Uh, and so the fishery as a whole had to shut down before the fishery in 1A had, had taken its uh, uh, harvest. So I have a concern about this, you know, having, uh, having a suggestion of a cause and effect here of the uh, 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 fixed gear per se or only seasonal restriction having an imp impact on uh, uh, seasonal prices. So my uh, suggestion to the board is I think we need to remove this particular statement uh, from here because I, I don't think it's really base has a good solid basis of fact. And if we need a motion to remove it, uh, you know, I was looking at this as you've add added something to it uh, and you are looking for concurrence with the board to add these sections to it. Is that the case or not? The board is is feel feel free to re, uh, revise any part of the document. So if you if you would like to, there's comments or changes can be made. Uh, I think when we get to uh, consideration on the document, then I think a motion would be in order. Um, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just follow up to David Pierce's question about uh, 
whether or not there is discussion about fishery independent data. There was, in fact, at the main public hearing, a um, fair amount of discussion, some comments on in, in support of inclusion of, of fishery independent data, particularly in reference to any work that was done by either states or, or academic research. Um, felt that any any data was good data as long as it was uh, vetted, you know, vetted through the TC. Any other questions from the board? Okay, seeing none, um, <clears throat> Jeff, uh, chair of the AP, had a question for Ashton. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the board allowing me to speak. Um, my question was, I think when you were talking about, this is on issue three, the fi empty fish hold provision, um, options B2 and C2, which wouldn't require federal adoption, I think you said that the states would be in a position where they'd have to inspect every fish hold on every trip before people left. And I don't think that that is really what's being um, considered um, on the federal side. I, I think it's more of a spot check kind of a situation. So not sure where you got the information that every trip would be inspected, but I, I think that's an issue that needs to be clarified. Thanks. Thank you for clearing that, find that, Jeff. Okay, Ashton is, um, well, I'm sorry, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do have a, a couple of questions. Um, we're looking at a species that's about 200% over the, the target for spawning stock biomass, right? And I'm looking at the, the problem statement here. Um, which talks about spawning area efficacy and whether we're timing that properly. And then the empty fish hold uh, provision as well. And I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, how important are these issues really to, to the resources as it, as it currently exists? And, and the other thing is, I, and I may have missed it at the beginning of your presentation, if so I apologize. Um, the, the, the status quo provisions, when were they implemented and, and how long have those status quo provisions been in effect and are they not um, helping us to, to reach our goal with this resource? Thank you. Renee, Renee you want to answer that? Yeah, I was just going to go back to the document that you all have in front of you. There's a history of the management in this fishery, and I don't have the page in front of me at the moment. If you bear with me one moment, I can find it and then refer people to it. But it has the history of the different management options and which amendment or addendum they were implemented with. Um, some of these have been in place longer than others. Um, as far as the spawning closures, I'll have to go back to the document. Let me find that page and I can reference it and we can potentially get it up on the screen as well. Any other questions while Renee is searching for that? Okay. Okay, sorry for the delay on that. There have been extensive measures in this fishery over time. Um, so if on per page 36 and 37 of the document, it gives a little bit of a history of the different management that has occurred in the herring fishery. 
um, all the way from the original FMP, which was implemented. The spawning closures as they stand now were modified slightly, um, which was a time when I was very new to this fishery. Um, in addendum five, they were slightly modified to where they are today. That was 2012. And they've been, the, the spawning measures have been in place since 2012 as they stand today. Follow up? Follow up, thank you. Um, so they've been in place since 2012. And, and then if I follow down on page 38, in terms of, of the goals, to achieve on a continuing basis optimum yield for the United States fishing industry to prevent overfishing, et cetera. Um, and then the second objective is to provide for the orderly development of the offshore and inshore fisheries, taking into account the, the viability of the current participants in, in the fishery. So, and, and, and I apologize if, if much of this has been hashed out in the New England Council, but we don't have much of a herring fishery in New York, so I haven't been following that. But my question is, if the status quo has been in place since 2012, has the status quo been doing an adequate job in, in helping us to, to reach and maintain those two goals? Thank you. So the technical committee and PDT specifically tasked this body with giving us specific goals because that was somewhat a question of ours as well. So we wanted to know last year if individuals remember at this meeting, we said is the purpose of us looking again at the spawning to protect spawning fish or to protect the act of spawning? And essentially the answer was both. So that we've had a lot of feedback that the spawning closures are not adequate, they haven't been working correctly, they're at the wrong time, they need to be revisited. So that allowed us as a technical body to go back and look at now a decade's worth of data to come forth with a presentation of a new methodology that we believe will do a much more adequate job protecting spawning fish and spawning that is occurring. Uh, one more follow-up? Yeah, I don't want to get into a protracted debate about this, so just one quick uh, follow-up. So my, my question still remains, though, has the status quo been, been adequate? H have we maintained our goals adequately with the status quo? That's kind of a yes or no. Thank you. I don't know that that is a yes or a no answer. We've, we've been tasked to look at this specific item because it has been believed that it has not been effective based on the goals of the board, uh, whether that is correct or not. Um, we've, we've been asked to look at this time and time again, and now we've been able to take a look at many years of data in order to do that. Um, I, I think to add to that too is the, the concern is even though we have uh, a good healthy stock, we want to maintain that and, and continue it in that uh, situation. So that, that's part of this effort as well. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, thank you. Chairman, it always begs the question, oh, when is enough enough? And I don't need an answer. It's kind of a rhetorical thing. We seem to want to get more and more and more and the question always is at the expense of who. We continue to do single species management. We worry about the impact on other fisheries. In the meantime, the economic value goes up or down, and, uh, and the folks who are living on this, their income goes down. So it's a catch-22, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Ashton now is going to uh, uh, give us the uh, AP report. <laughs> um, the AP has not met since the last meeting, so uh, to try to save some time, uh, she's just going to go ahead and give the recommendations that the AP gave to us at the last meeting. 
Okay, I was, as was stated, I just have two slides here for the AP report. I did give the AP a, a chance to, re, to respond and maybe change their, their opinions if those had changed in the two months um, and had not. So I will review uh, what was presented at the annual meeting in a um, quick summary. So for the spawning area monitoring system, there was general consensus in favor of option C, the GSI 30 based forecast system. Um, it was believed that it will improve accuracy in when the spawning area should close, and also it provided more advanced warning, which they were in favor of. There was one person in favor of option A, status quo. For default closure dates, uh, five were in favor. Of the, well, there was no general consensus on the default closure dates. Um, that was due to what they felt was the uncertainty of the outcome of picking a trigger. But if they had to, then they said that five, five were in favor of option C1, 70th, 70th percentile. Um, they felt like it would, it would provide additional protection, so fishing just prior to spawning would not happen. One person opposed the 70th percentile because they felt it would require a longer closure period. For the spawning area boundaries, uh, there was general consensus in favor of status quo, maintaining the three, cur the three spawning area boundaries. Um, they did not want a large coastal shutdown if areas were combined. For the spawning closure period, seven were in favor of status quo. Um, they felt that it was, they felt, some felt that there was not enough social and economic data to justify a six week closure at this time and they felt the, the four weeks w was sufficient. Uh, three were in favor of option B, six weeks. The spawning reclosure period. Three were in favor of option A, status quo. Two were in favor of the defined protocol. For moving beyond the spawning area options, for the fixed gear set aside, they were unanimous, unanimously in favor of option A, status quo. Um, keep the, the 295 metric ton set aside and it will roll over on November 1st. Uh, the empty fish hold provision, five, so they, they preferred option, the C options, which were the adjusted language options. This meant that the empty fish hold provision would only apply to vessels that can pump. So five were in favor of C2, meaning it's not contingent on federal adoption. Uh, the commission would move forward with it regardless of what framework four or final rule says. Two were in favor of um, the, the vessel, only applying it to vessels that can pump, but only if it's contingent on federal adoption. So that concludes the advisory panel summary. Any questions? Any questions uh, for Jeff or Ashton on that report? Okay, seeing none, we will move into final adoption. Um, I have a number of um, motions uh, that people have already uh, requested to make. Um, and I've decided to take um, each of these items individually as opposed to taking a suite of motions. And um, I'll alternate uh, between um, members making motions that have already made the motions and I'll also look for hands if, if uh, people want to make uh, separate motions as well. So um, I'll start with Terry. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, Cenk, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I do want to quickly respond to Emerson's question about the uh, uh, task, the, the work of the, of the TC, and I want to strongly respond that the, the TC did exactly what the section requested that they do, which was to review the efficacy of the spawning areas. And this request was in part um, uh, um, uh, an issue that the state of Maine raised uh, was some questions we had about the default days in, in the eastern Gulf of Maine. Um, is it, is it, and, and our question was, are, are we doing the best job or aren't we? Uh, they had the opportunity to review uh, multiple years of, of, of uh, spawning closures and, and data and came up with a, um, a new way of doing things, which to me was exactly what we tasked them to do, and I appreciate all the work that they did. So to that point, I'm going to move to adopt option C, the GSI based forecast system for section 4.2.6.1, the spawning area closure monitoring system. This system will be implemented for one year and will be reviewed by the technical committee in the section for effectiveness. If the GSI based system is effective, it can be continued either indefinitely or for a time certain by a majority vote of the herring section. If the section deems the GSI based system to not be effective, 
the spawning area closure monitoring system will automatically revert to option B. And if I get a second, I will give my rationale. Uh, second, uh, Mr. Abbott. Uh, any? Yeah, thank, thank you, Dennis. Uh, option C was favored by the AP in a number of the public comments. Um, as I st just stated, I continue to support the work of the TC, and I'm attracted to, to a completely new concept that better targets closures to a period of time when the majority of the fish are spawning. Um, at, at this point, I favor the, the advanced warning system and that samples come from both independent and dependent sources. Allowing the system to be reviewed after one year addresses the public comments expressing concern that we may be moving in the, we may have uh, done too much too quickly. And should the TC or section not support extending the forecast system, then option B reinstates the status quo sampling program, addresses the concerns raised concerning sufficient sampling uh, uh, by, by adjusting to include both fishery independent and independent data. I, I thank the TC. I think he did a great job. Any discussion? David. Yeah, I also will believe the TC uh, did a great job on this. It's been uh, long in development. And yes, indeed, it is a bit of a, uh, well, it's new, a new approach, but uh, it is worthy uh, of, our, of our trying. And Terry's motion is to that effect. In other words, we'll see how it works. And if not, then we bounce back to something a little less, uh, a little less um, on the projection uh, side. Uh, we use uh, option B. Um, I, I favor this forecast system as well. Uh, I am a bit concerned about the, the numbers of samples that would be used with this uh, GSI 30 base forecast system. In other words, we use a minimum of, uh, of uh, three fishery dependent or independent samples, each with 25 female uh, herring, and it's a bit different from uh, option B where more fish are taken with uh, one less sample. But I'm not gonna argue over, over this. It would be kind of a hair splitting. I'd rather, I'd rather go with what's been offered up to us as a progressive way forward, and then we see how it works. So I, uh, I favor the option. Uh, I favor the motion. The only thing I, I don't see as part of this motion, and maybe uh, Terry or someone else is going to address it uh, in a subsequent motion, and that would be the GSI 30 trigger value. I'm assuming it's uh, going to come up uh, as, another, as another motion. So, all right, with that said, then I'll, uh, I, again, I support the motion. Any other comments? Yes, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the concern I have with this motion is, is that it includes the term effective um, in there several times. And, and I'm not sure what that means, that we will, you know, implement it for one year and then review its effectiveness. And if it's effective, then it will be you know, it, it will go on until we decide to change it. So what, what's, how are we going to quantify effectiveness, I guess is the question. Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the question. Um, uh, you've had the luxury of not having to live the uh, weekly uh, section meetings we have year after year after year as we try to balance out the uh, uh, period two quota. Um, and uh, the forecasting of, uh, that we do in the days out scenarios and the intent to take a, what seems like a large amount of quota and make it last from the 1st of June through the end of September, it's, 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 it's been a challenging job. The, um, this effort is layered over by, by the, the spawning protection and I mean, effective, to, I think, in the in at least from the from the vision of the northern New England uh, states, would be that we're able to parse if the um, quota out through period two, and that um, there's a fair and equitable access to the resource by by the by the players. Um, I mean, we have um, a trawl fishery that starts uh, uh, effective the first of October and um, they have their access to the fishery after the per se only fishery is concludes. So I th think if um, this body, after the technical committee reviews the protection of what, have we actually protected the fish at the time when they're spawning will be the first question. The second will be, have we as a section provided opportunities uh, for, the, for the industry to fully harvest their, their quota and spread it over, over the period of time? 
Thank you for putting that on the record. Um, Terry uh, Renee would like to uh, ask a question. So Terry, in your motion, you lay out that you would like the TC to evaluate the effectiveness. Uh, just curious if you have any specific thoughts along those lines, how we would evaluate. For example, when scenarios are playing, because there are so many different options within this option, essentially. So for example, if you were to go with this methodology and say you chose the 70th percentile, so the most protection for pre-spawning fish, and went with a four-week closure, you run the risk of having spawning fish on the tail end because you went to protect more pre-spawning fish. So it may look like this was not effective when really it was just the very conservative tied in with a four-week closure. So that, that's, I, do you understand where my question is coming from? It, it, exactly. It was originally my intention to make a package motion, but uh, the, the chair has decided to take uh, them in f five bite-sized pieces. So we'll find out what the section, it, should this motion go up or down, we'll, we'll find out what the, what the will of the section is, and then we'll, we'll have at least a, a, a target to work with. Okay. Any other? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understood your description of effectiveness, Terry, and I understand the mess you guys got in last couple of years up there. But if this motion is standalone and goes out without the clarification as you described, uh, then again, we're still left with the, what does effectiveness mean? And it, it, for clarification purposes, again, Terry, either you or the staff would put together, I would hope, a list of those possible measures of effectiveness. Otherwise, I think this is going to be left open to interpretation. Am I correct, or did I miss something? No, we want to touch that with a 10-foot pole, huh? You want to try that, Terry? Sure. I, I mean, I, 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 I can't answer that right now, Pat, uh, until I see what the final, uh, what the f of, uh, final vote of the section is. We've, you know, we've got four other measures that, that need to be rolled into uh, overlay with this, should this even be uh, approved by the section. So um, I think it would be incumbent upon, um, you know, I'll certainly volunteer myself and my staff to work, you know, who is on the T TC to come back with a proposal for the, for the section. And if we're scheduled to meet at our, uh, at the uh, spring meeting, we can review it at that point. Um, if, if that works with you, Mr. Chairman. Doug. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Terry, for making this motion. You know, I think it's a reasonable motion uh, to have us transitioned into something that could potentially help us with our, our spawning closure management here and improve things. Um, I certainly understand uh, the desire to um, have a let's try it out for a year and see how it works uh, provision uh, with uh, as long as we can uh, move it forward following a uh, 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 a rev uh, favorable review of the program with just a, uh, a board vote as opposed to a management action. So I support this motion. Any other? Seeing none, do we need to caucus? Seeing shaking heads, then uh, all in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Abstentions? Nulls? Passes unanimously. Okay, now we need a motion on uh, option C, whether it's one, two, or three. Uh, Doug, did you have a motion? For now? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This was sort of uh, one of the things that was missing from this was the uh, technical committee wanted us to have a uh, select a trigger value um, which uh, whether the GSI th uh, 30 trigger would be um, 23, 25, or 28. Um, and also tied to that was um, these trigger values potentially would be the default closure dates which are shown down on on uh, page 58 um, and 59. So I'm going to, my motion is 
uh, under section 4.2.6.1, uh, the trigger value uh, will be uh, the 80th percentile GSI 30 trigger equals 25. Uh, and also, um, as far as the default date, sub-option 2, C2 uh, would be selected. And if I can get a second to this, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, describe why, uh, give my uh, uh, rationale for this. Second by Mr. Stockwell. Uh, go ahead, Doug. Um, one of the things we uh, need to look at is to make sure that we are covering uh, uh, sufficient spawning uh, closures, uh, uh, covering su uh, sufficient fish, uh, making sure that we're spawning, covering the spawning fish. Um, one of the things that I saw with the 80% is it doesn't push us right up to the end, yet it, does, it, it doesn't go uh, too early. But more importantly to me, when I saw what the uh, default closure dates were for uh, uh, some of the other options, uh, I was, and understand what the default closure dates are for is in case we don't have any samples where we cannot predict. Uh, it was going, uh, um, particularly with option C3 where we chose the 90, if we were to choose the 90th percentile, we would have a default closure date that's a full three to four weeks after what our current default is. And with the exception of a couple years, we have had evidence of spawning fish from our sampling uh, on, uh, on or before September 21st. So I was not uh, comfortable with going out uh, that far with a default closure date. I'm much more comfortable with something closer to the beginning of October. Um, and again, if we have samples, it may come earlier, it may come later. It all depends on what the uh, fish samples are showing. showing. So I support this and uh, thank you. Any other comment? Terry. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I support Doug's motion as well. I was prepared to come in with a different number, but I mean, uh, questions that both Emerson and, and Renee asked on how to measure effectiveness. I think after end of a year, we'll we'll run we'll run this through the process and see see where it lands. And um, we may, uh, assuming we we decide a year from now to continue the forecast system, we may end up all, uh, you know amending this approach, but. Uh, it's, it's a good start. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, do we need to call? Whoops, sorry, Dave. No, I've, uh, I've labored over this as well, uh, in part because of uh, at least one set of comments that indicated that if we chose uh, the option that we did choose in the previous uh, motion, they would support uh, the 90th percentile, that is the uh, GSI 30 trigger is equal to 28, which closes the fish rate just prior to spawning. Uh, so I was seriously thinking about using that option or selecting that option, but after giving it uh, more thought and after uh, reading the document again to determine uh, what our objective is, what our concerns are, the statement of the problem, uh, this strikes a, a middle-of-the-road approach, which is, uh, I think, uh, which is acceptable. Uh, going with the 70th percentile is just too too conservative because it would close the fish rate. Um, well, um, too soon before the fish really are getting ready to spawn. And then the 90th percentile really puts us on the edge. We close just prior to spawning, so we we could miss it. It could be spawning, and, and we miss it. So. This uh, 80th percentile gives us a better chance of, uh, of um, closing when it needs to be closed. And as it says in the document itself, we uh, deal with later stages of maturity uh, but, and just before spawning. So it's, uh, it is precautionary, uh, it is conservative, but it's not uh, um, too precautionary and too conserv conservative, which obviously works to the, uh, to the detriment of some, some of the users of this resource. Any other comments? Seeing none, need to caucus. Seeing a few shaking heads. Um, all in, uh, 
Is there a need to caucus? Take a minute. Okay, all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Nulls? No votes? Passes unanimously. Okay, 4.2.6.2. Terry, you have a motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to select under 4.1.3. Uh, option A, status quo, maintain the current spawning areas. Is there a second? Bill Adler? Want to speak to it, Terry? Yeah, sure. Rationale is pretty, pretty straightforward. It was strongly supported by the industry, um, uh, it, who expressed a lot of concern about um, uh, the potential for some huge shutdowns at the time of the year when we're trying to effectively uh, um, parse out the bait through period two. So I, th I think given that we're, we're going to be reviewing this uh, entire uh, uh, action in a year from now, that status quo is, is the best decision. Okay. <clears throat> any, um, any other comments? Any need to caucus? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Nulls? No votes? Passes unanimously. Doug, do you have a uh, motion for the next item? Yes, I move to select under section 4.2.6.4 spawning closure period, uh, option A, status quo, four weeks. Second by Mr. Stockwell. Want to speak to it, Doug? Yes, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I think a four-week uh, closure is appropriate as long as we have the mechanism to reclose uh, in place. Uh, which we currently do, and hopefully in the, a follow-up motion, we will be able to refine it so that we can do it a little bit quicker. But uh, I think that's a key thing from my perspective, that if we're going to stay with four weeks, we need to have a reclosure option. David. Yeah, Doug stated it very well. I'll just highlight uh, some very important text and logic that's a uh, presented uh, in the document itself, and that's on page 24 under spawning area efficacy. It's the paragraph uh, at the bottom of page 24, and this is uh, quite important, and I think all of us have learned this uh, the hard way, that is the impacts of, uh, of, um, of lengthy closures. And it says, an extension of the closure period from four to six weeks, which represents one aspect of the potential changes, could potentially have a negative impact on the herring industry. Fishermen and bait dealers know the stock is rebuilt, and indeed it is. Therefore, further protection via a six-week closure is not warranted and will reduce market opportunities, and, that, and I believe that is correct. Additionally, fishermen express concern that effort by midwater trawlers could be displaced farther northeast where smaller fish are located if the spawning closure lasted for six weeks. And over the years, uh, I've certainly witnessed that happening, the uh, midwater trawlers moving to the north uh, and to the east fishing in areas where smaller fish uh, can be found and are found. Of course, per se, do the same thing, not just midwater trawlers. So, um, uh, consistent with my desire not to promote anything that would prompt the, the fishery itself to shift onto smaller fish, I would say that this is a good logic for us uh, sticking with the uh, status quo. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, need to caucus? Seeing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Null votes? No. Pass unanimously. Okay, Doug, do you have a motion on the reclosure protocol? Yes, since this is part of the uh, same section, I move to select under section 
0.6.4, spawn enclosure period, reclosure protocol, option B, defined protocol. Second by Mr. Stockwell. Any comments? Doug, you want to speak to it? or? Yes, one of the uh, issues we had last year um, was uh, we had some samples prior to, to uh, the reopening, um, and um, according to the current management plan, we couldn't use those samples, even though they suggested that spawning was still ongoing. I think we need to modify that uh, to allow samples to be, ta be taken from w either fisheries-dependent or fisheries-independent sources in that week before uh, we, we reopen so that if we do see spawning still occurring, that we can uh, keep it closed in, uh, uh, without having to, to reopen it first. Any other comments? Seeing none, need to, oh, Dave, sorry. Yeah, Doug, as uh, described what happened uh, last fall, in that uh, the fishery opened up, spawning was uh, deemed to be over, but we decided, of course, to continue to monitor as we are obliged to do. Uh, and we were informed in Massachusetts anyways, and the other states as well, that spawning was still ongoing. And there was some discrepancy regarding whether or not that was true. Uh, my staff and the state of Maine staff uh, either did not communicate or there was a misunderstanding. As it turns out, uh, the sample of fish that was used to judge that the fish was still spawning, I believe, was from an otter trawl trip, uh, not in the general area that have, that's of great concern to, to me, notably off of Massachusetts. So we decided to do what we thought was the right thing, which was to sample the fishery that would be impacted by a continued spawn enclosure uh, in a major way, and that was the midwater trawl fleet. So we we had opened and then we sampled immediately when the fish came in and the spawning was still going on uh, at a relatively low level but high enough so we uh, reclosed. So this particular um, option B um, does uh, potentially put us in a position where the same situation might occur again. Uh, that is you know, what, what constitutes uh, fishery independent information that would warrant a reclosure of, uh, of a fishery that um, has been closed for a while and actually awaits to get going again in hopes that the fish are not spawning or go, or go to an area where the fish are not spawning. So I'm, uh, I'm uneasy about this primarily because of the fact that uh, um, again, fisheries independent information uh, is not defined well enough. So I'll, uh, I'm going to oppose the motion um, for the reason that I've just stated. I, I just don't want to repeat of what happened this past fall. Thank you, Dave. Um, I know some of um, the dependent information could come from tuna fishermen that are rod and reel herring. And I know that they, uh, last year, they volunteered to provide samples. So that, that, that could be a method of getting dependent. Uh, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's quite correct. But as we all know, there is a great deal of controversy and conflict between those individuals who rightfully so are concerned about the impact of midwater trawling specifically on the availability of tuna. So if I'm to say to the Midwater Trawl Fleet operating out of Gloucester, oh, by the way, we are reclosing because tuna fishermen have reported that the fish are still spawning, uh, that's a problem. So that's another reason why uh, I don't, don't support this motion because of the possibility that the fishery to be impacted by a reclosure uh, will not be the fishery that is resampled to determine if the fish is still spawning. Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I share David's uh, concern, but I have a different perspective. I, my sense is that this motion will preclude that from happening again. Um, and um, I guess going back to the general theme of effectiveness, we'll know for sure at the end of the year. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my concern on this thing uh, goes back to what David had said something about audit going the samples we're taking from audit trawls, and from what I understand, um, 
The spawning fish, correct me if I'm wrong, the spawning fish are frequently on the bottom and the spent fish where the midwater trawlers and probably the persanas would get them it has moved up in the water column. So if you're going to test for spawning fish and you pick them off the bottom, oh yeah, they're all spawning. And maybe they're not. Uh, and I don't know how to fix that. But if that's the, the scenario, we've got to be very careful when we go and take that test where we're getting that fish from. Thank you. Any other comments? Need to caucus? Take a couple minutes. Okay, we ready? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? One. Null votes. Passes 6 1. Okay, f I think we're 4.2.7.1. Terry, you have a motion? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move, um, I move uh, um, option B to remove the rollover provision. Um, and uh, my terminology is a little bit uh, um, impeded because I think I've got the wrong numbers in my notes, so I'm going to have to refer to Tim, uh, Mike to get the right numbers up on the board. Second. Seeing no second, is there another motion? Doug? Move to select under section 4.2.7.2 fixed gear set aside provision adjustment, option A, status quo. Is there a second? Bill? Mr. Adler, second. Want to speak to it, Doug? So my rationale is that uh, the data in the uh, uh, document shows that they rarely have caught fish after November, um, and uh, the advisory panel um, was supporting the status quo on this. Terry? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to speak in strong opposition to this motion. Um, it's certainly obvious why there's um, no landings after the 1st of November is because the fishery is closed. Um, there's no opportunity for, for the small uh, fixed gear fishermen to, to um, have any access to the fish after the overall quota is gone. Um, Pat Keller and I met with fixed gear fishermen the last number of years reporting that a, a bunch of fish have arrived post uh, closure of the overall 1A fishery and they've, they've had no opportunities. So, 295 tons is not a great deal of fish to, to and we, we bend over backwards sometimes in this commission to help the small guys and it's not a small amount of fish um the ap look at the ap composition it's much um you know until um until just recently we had no fixed gear fishermen on there uh, by the time uh, we finally had them put on the ap the ap uh, the ap had already made the recommendation so um for those reasons i do not support this motion. Bill? Yeah, my question on this uh, had to do with uh, the fact that uh, if, if they don't use the 295 or 6 metric tons, it gets rolled into Area 1A, and 
the fixed gear fishermen could still use it. It's just coming out of 1A. Now, I, I do understand uh, what Terry just said about, well, yeah, but when the whole thing closes, the whole thing closes and you lose it. Um, but I don't know if they don't take the 295, they don't take all of the metric tons, and they keep it. Uh, they can keep fishing if the fish show up again after 1A is closed. And if they don't take it then, what happens to the, let's say the 195 or whatever it is they have left over, Where does do we just lose it? Terry? Yeah, that, that's correct. You know, if out of the 295 tons, uh, there's only been a small, as Doug pointed out, there's only a small amount of it harvested prior to the closure of the overall quota. Um, this, this should, um, should this uh, option uh, be move ahead, it would allow the, the fixed gear fishermen the opportunity to fish until the end of the calendar year. Um, any uncaught fish would be uh, conserv of conservation value, uh, would not be available for use the next uh, following year. Any other comments? Seeing none, do we need a caucus? Seeing shaking heads, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Two opposed. One, two, three, four. Four, we're missing one. That's four to two. Motion fails, four to two. Mr. Chairman. New motion. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I abstained on that. Oh, motion. you abstained. I'm sorry. It's Thank right. you, Rod. So the vote was four to one. So that would uh, mean that status quo uh, stays in place. Okay, 4.2.8. Uh, uh, point, point order. Tony has. He could have another crack, maybe worded a little differently, I guess. If it didn't. If it didn't get a second, then technically it wasn't on the board uh, for the parliamentary reasons, I think. Unless you, but Mr. Chairman, it's, up, it's your decision. Uh, it's you, your can't re, you can't do the same motion at the same meeting, but it failed for a lack of a second. So Dennis is a good Robert's Rules of Order for me. Yeah, I, I don't believe that can be brought up again. I... Yes, go ahead, Mark. I would have seconded that motion. It happened so fast that, so I don't know if that means anything now, but I would have had I been going as fast as you were. I don't have the you want to comment either. There? Yes, just on this, I, I think my uh, take on this from a Robert's Rules of Order is that if, if, he had been sec if he had clearly made a motion and had been seconded um, and had been defeated, you could not bring it up at the meeting. But it never received a second. So it really was not uh, uh, a motion that the board had at that particular point in time. Uh, and I, um, given the fact that we're now in a conundrum that the status quo has failed, um, I think uh, it would be warranted unless somebody uh, uh, here at the board, or maybe my parliamentary expert thinks that uh, I may be in error. I think you could take this since it was not seconded and was not a. Uh, Dennis, can you bail us out of this? <laughs> Thank you. I was out of the room, so I'm not sure really what happened. But from <laughs> what I gather, and maybe Senator Langley can agree or disagree, if this mo you're trying to get back to this motion. No. I'm no. We're trying to get back to the motion that Terry had made. Didn't give a second. I can't comment on that. That's that's just not there anymore. 
Excuse me. I don't see why not. There was okay, no I'm action gonna... taken on it. There was no, there was nothing, no vote taken. Yeah, someone there could be another person in attendance who suddenly feels that they'd be willing to second the motion. That would okay, be unless there's an objection, I'm going to uh, take the motion uh, a second time. You'd like to make it, Terry? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move to select under Section 4.2.7.2 fixed gear set aside provision, option B. Is there a second? Mark. Want, want to speak to it again, or do you, do you don't think there's a need? I don't want to t test my luck. <laughs> need for a caucus? Seeing none. All in favor, raise your right hand. Seven. Okay, opposed, none, all, none, pass unanimously. Empty fish hold provision, Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move to select under section 4.2.8, empty fish hold provision, option C1, uh, federal state empty fish hold provision for selected vessels, for select vessels. And that motion uh, does make it contingent on federal adoption? It makes the, uh, it contingent upon federal adoption. It has, uh, it, it only is going to be applied to A and B vessels that are, uh, uh, must pump fish. Uh, I think it gets at what we're trying to do here and again it's contingent on whether the federal uh, provision is uh, approved uh, which I think is important to be uh, as consistent as possible with with our federal partners here is there a second David Pierce speak to it David yeah I don't know where this stands right now with federal review uh, I can't recall what the service has said publicly on this particular issue, but uh, why not take the lead and indicate to the National Marine Fisheries Service that this is something we feel uh, should occur, and uh, you know, we'll make it contingent upon their implementing the option, and we'll assume that they will. Uh, so I, I can support this motion and, uh, and just hope that the, the service will overcome whatever reservations it may have about this particular empty hole provision and go with it. I know that uh, at our Gloucester public hearing, everyone was in favor of this particular measure, including those who are involved in the Midwater Trawl Fleet. They said there was absolutely no reason why a vessel should be going back to sea with, uh, with fish on board. So I'd say there's a lot of support from the industry for this particular strategy, and uh, uh, I hope it passes. Mark, did you have? Oh, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'd like to thank the commission for spending to, so much time on this uh, particular issue, and uh, you know, obviously, I would support it. And it, what it does is it fully reflects actual fishing practices, and, and I'm not talking about wasteful fishing practices. So, hopefully, the commission will follow through and uh, pass this one along as well. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, need for caucus. Seeing no heads shaking, uh, all those in favor, raise your right hand. Um, okay, opposed, nulls, pass unanimously. Okay, now, um, Doug, did you have a motion on uh, implementation date? Yeah, I didn't uh, send it to Ashton, but uh, I'll put up a motion on an implementation date for uh, board consideration. I'm not tied to this date, but um, I was going to move to have an implementation date of uh, June 1, 2016, 
uh, and I'll, if I get a second to that, I'll give my rationale for that date. Second, uh, Bill Adler. Yeah, that's uh, the beginning of the uh, 1A uh, fishery every every year based on our uh, 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 section action here. So it seems if we had this in place by then, even if uh, the states can do this in their regulatory process, it seemed like a convenient, uh, uh, an appropriate date to have an implementation. David, you have a comment? Well, obviously, we'll move forward as fast as we can to implement what needs to be uh, put in place. But uh, just as a word of caution, uh, um, it may be difficult for us to make this uh, implementation date of, of June 1st because of the new nature of the review within, uh, within the Commonwealth as to what regulations are going to go to public hearing, what comes out of public hearing. It's become a lot more complicated for us uh, in uh, the last few years. So if this passes, we'll strive for June 1st. But I just wanted to make everyone aware that it may be July or August, uh, but we'll move as quickly as we can on it. Any other comments? Yes, Mark, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just express the same concerns um, for Rhode Island. We're into February and our we already have a loaded you know, public hearing docket and in-house uh, action. So I wouldn't ask the date be changed, but I think we can make it, but we never know. <clears throat> Thank you. Terry? Ditto for Maine. Okay. All on the record. Um, need to caucus. Seeing no heads shaking. All in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? No votes? Okay. Motion passes. Okay, now we're going to need a motion to uh, pass the amendment, and uh, this will be a roll call vote. Bill, would you like to make that a motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we pass this amendment as adjusted today and as chosen today. Is that what you want? Yes. Is there a second? Well, stand by. Tony. Bill, because this is an amendment, we need to um, take this to the full commission, so it would be moved to recommend to the full commission uh, yep. to approve amendment three <laughs> um, as modified today. That sounds good. Yes, that, that, that's what I said. I, I thought you said that, Bill. Thank, thank you, Bill. Is there a second? Steve, Steve Train. Need to caucus. Seeing no heads shaking. Uh, we'll need the roll call red. Terry Stockwell? Yes. Okay. Just, just go with me. Okay. New Hampshire? Yes. Massachusetts? Yes. Rhode Island? Yes. Connecticut? Yes. New York? Yes. New Jersey? Yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. Very good. Uh, I know we're trying to make up time. I uh, had one more agenda item uh, that I requested of Ashton, and that's an overview of the research set-aside program. Uh, you have a written document that was handed out, and um, my suggestion is that we wait until the next meeting for her to go over that and answer any questions. So if there's no objections to that, um, move to the la last item of business. Uh, any new business? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn. Mr. Oops, go ahead, Dennis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
At this time, I'd like to, to recognize the super effort that Mr. Augustine put in to bring cookies to the meeting. He, he did this on ver seriously. He did this on very short notice, as he didn't know he was coming to the meeting until last week. And for those of us who have been around a while, we know why Pat brings the cookies, and it's a reminder of something that happened in the past. So, I thank you, Pat, for what you do. We will start the summer founders cup and black sea bass board in about five minutes. Thanks for the cookies, Pat. Stop it already. Thank you. Enjoy them. It's going to get us through the next board meeting.